Um, Henry, I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, for everybody out there listening, uh, you know, $7 billion, every single startup uh, in the United States, I think you're almost close to 20,000 businesses sit on Carta. Everybody knows Carta. But let's go back to those really, really early days. Um, tell us just a little bit of the, the magic, the story of you, the aha moment, going to build the business, you get it up. What does that look like? And, and tell us what that was like. Yeah, I so Carta at the time it was called eShares. Um, you know, the idea came in after my first startup, which uh, crashed and burned, completely died. It actually, it didn't even crash and burn. We I think we got to like three or four people and and never got any further after a year and a half of work. And so we finally closed that down. And and you know, one of the investors I was working with on that company said to me, "Hey, Henry, you're a finance guy, kind of. You know, why is it that I can buy General Electric stock?" At the time for seven dollars today it's free but you know all online click a button everything you know um, uh, happens in instantly uh, but if i invest in two founders in a garage uh, it takes 30 days to close uh, costs fifteen thousand dollars in legal fees and i literally get this paper stock certificate in the mail and it seemed like such a, a discrepancy in this world of public how public markets operate public capital markets operate and how private capital markets operate and as we started a riff on this idea we said, is there, is there a possibility to build a stock exchange for private companies? So companies that didn't want to go public, wanted to stay private, but wanted liquidity uh, and, and create a spectrum of liquidity rather than this bifurcated binary world of zero liquidity in private markets and almost infinite liquidity in public markets. Uh, could we build, build something in the middle? And that got me very excited because I'd always been really interested in financial infrastructure companies. Any financial infrastructure idea was really exciting to me. Uh, and we, we figured out that the wedge to, to building that infrastructure to build a private stock market uh, was, was the cap tables. And so we said, hey, could we build a cap table product, get customers, uh, companies to let us manage their cap tables for them, and then use that as a Trojan horse into providing liquidity uh, for them. And that took uh, maybe six months of idea iteration and, and going through a lot of different uh, uh, ideas that didn't didn't make sense and didn't work and retracing and so on. There's, there's a lot of whiteboarding and thinking through that. But once once we could crystallize that vision of a stock market for private companies, a, a Trojan horse wedge in by, via the cap table, and we could draw the the, the path to uh, to the end state. Um, that's when I got really excited, and we incorporated the company, and, and off we went. So let's go back to those days. It was originally called eShares, um, and you had told me prior. Um, that raising your seed was actually really, really hard. Um, what were those roadblocks like? Why, first of all, the idea seems so obvious when you describe it that way that you're like, duh. Um, and I wish Inspired Capital existed at the time. I would have been very fortunate to invest. Um, why was the seed hard? What did people not get about the vision? I think there were two things that people struggled with in the early days, but maybe three. So so first is we were a fintech company in 2013, which which didn't exist at the time. FinTech in 2013 in Silicon Valley was, was payments. Uh, it was PayPal and other types of PayPal knockoffs. But FinTech, as we think of today, is financial infrastructure and capital markets and um, uh, banking. All, all of that didn't exist back then. So I would go on Sand Hill Road and talk to firms, and they just didn't understand um, finance. Just as a kind of um, to skip ahead to the, to the ending, you know, I ended up uh, for my Series A, not even my seed, I talked to 30 or 40 venture funds on Sand Hill Road. Got, I didn't even get partner meetings with them. And then I went to New York and I had three meetings and three term sheets. And it just showed at that at 2013 that New York-based VCs understood where fintech was going. Much they were way further ahead than the than the West Coast VCs at the time. But the the biggest issue in the seed round was um, two things. Uh, one is at the time Second Market had was a company that tried to do a private stock market and had failed. Uh, and so everybody said, this idea has been tried. You know, it's not an interesting idea. Like it, it won't work. There's no reason to think, you know, Henry is going to make this work if, if second market couldn't make it work. And then also when we came in with this cap table um, business, the, the feedback was how big is the market for cap tables, right? It's just venture. Venture is a small market. There aren't enough companies that want to buy cap table software. And another thing that was true in 2013, that isn't true anymore, is that back then, if you wanted to be a billion dollar, if you wanted to build a billion dollar business, market cap business, as a B2B business, you had to sell to basically Fortune 1000. Um, there were no startups ever uh, in 2013 that had a billion dollar or plus outcome that sold software to other startups. 
And, and so, so nobody had any, any pattern matching there. I think, you know, um, we'll very humbly uh, take, take a little bit of credit for this. I think there were a handful of companies born in that circa 2012 to 2015 that created billion dollar outcomes uh, by selling to other startups. We're, we're one of them. I think Zenefits uh, is another uh, one. But I think, I think maybe us and Zenefits are the only ones that were less like we're selling to other startups and we created a billion dollar outcome that didn't exist then. Now, all B2B startups start with other startups like that. That is the playbook. But that that wasn't true. And, and so I think for investors and one of the things I tell early stage founders that are going through seed rounds, especially when you're invest, you know, getting angel investors and in, 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 in that market, I think one, one of the things I think seed founders are really hard on themselves about is, is when they get rejections, they think that something was wrong with their pitch or they just weren't compelling enough or something's wrong with their idea. And at that stage, it's really less about, is it a good idea or a bad idea? I, I think it's a lot more about filtering out the people that don't get excited about the idea and the people that do. And so it's really, you got to work through the system to find the people that get excited because there's so much uncertainty. It's really a passion project at that stage, uh, both for the founder as well as the investor. And I could tell immediately in my early in, you know, seed fundraising meetings, I could tell within five minutes if they were going to invest or not. And almost everyone that invested, they invested purely because they believed in the that what we call the NASDAQ for private markets. They believed that this company should exist and they wanted to bet on, on us being that company. Uh, and so the, it was a, it wasn't as it wasn't a compelling pitch or, or charisma that, that got them. It was just that they were already predisposed to love this idea. I, I couldn't agree with that more. As you know, a, a managing partner of Inspired, I, you know, we meet hundred companies a week, and you're absolutely right. Um, often, if you say no, first of all, sometimes it's just that partnership or those people don't fully understand the idea or they're not excited about it personally. Also, not every, you know, funds have very different things that they look for. And that's the other thing. I think it's a, a good message that Henry just shared with everybody, which is it is not always, no is not always necessarily a bad thing. And it's not because you failed. Um, sometimes it's just you're not a great fit for that firm or, or for that partnership specifically. Um, so let's go backwards. Um, you started off as the, the cap table. And then quickly, you guys moved into being able to support venture funds. Walk everybody through a little bit of the chapters, because I think one of the things that struck me the most about Carta, by the way, I use Carta on like seven levels of my life, um, but it, it was amazing to me just how each time you, 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 you know, were able to summon a plateau, a new door opened and a new business actually sat right in front of Carta. And in, you know, the rear view mirror, it's genius. Um, what was it like for you as you were actually, you know, getting to each of those summits? Was it always obvious that there was this next chapter right behind it and the next chapter? And now you're all the way at Carta X. So just walk people through those chapters a little bit. Sure. So back at, when we did the seed in Series A, we um, had a path to Carta X so we could see the milestones. So, so many of those things we saw ahead of time and, and were deterministic. Uh, I would say the fund business, the fund administration business, we didn't see, I, or I didn't see at least in 2014, that uh, you know, we kind of discovered or unlocked. And that's what's been really fun and exciting about our business is we, we, the more problems we solve, the more problems we get to solve. And how that happened was really happenstance. Um, we had all these investors that were had Carta accounts on the platform and they liked being able to manage all of this. And then I had a um, a, a business school student that had just finished at Wharton, he cold emailed me. He had been, he had done before Wharton, he was an associate at a venture fund. And he said, Hey, I think you could take your cap table software and use it to help venture funds manage their LPs. And I said, Oh, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. You know, why don't you come here? I'll give you a small team and you go build that business for us. And so he did, and he, he sort of got it going and we built a lot of tools uh, and so once we learned more about how you, you as a venture capitalist, you know, Alexa, manage your, your SOI, the, the thesis became very clear. We could do for schedules of investments what we did for cap tables. All we did with cap tables was we moved it in the cloud and make it real time as opposed to email your paralegal and get it in a spreadsheet. Today, most venture funds they email their fund accountant and get their SOI in a spreadsheet 30 days later. And we said we can move all of that in line with the same same software. We to, to get there, we just have to own all of the back office. Uh, it also really played very nicely into our playbook that 
we love entering services businesses that are differentiated only by brand, right? There, you know, there's no like better income statement. You, you either get it right or you get it wrong. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, and you know, all that differentiates one service provider from another is, hey, we're, you know, we, we offer better customer service. And what we like to do is enter these markets and say, look, we're coming in with technology that's differentiated. We did that with cap tables. Cap tables was a services business. We turned to a software business. We did that with 49A. It was a services uh, analyst business that we turned into a software business. And then we could take that same playbook and thesis with fund administration and move all of the manual accounting effort into the cloud and make it automated online. And you know, we started that business, uh, I think in 2018, and it went from zero to 30 million in ARR in about 25 months. And so it was just, it just took off. Um, and so we're starting to look at more of those, you know, types of things, wherever where we have this hammer, you know, how many nails can we find? Talk a little bit about Carta X and just as, you know, uh, a certified financial planner as somebody who built LearnBest, by the way, I couldn't agree with you more. I started LearnBest in 2008, FinTech, New York City. There was no concept. Uh, you know, I was, I was still uh, trying to convince people that, you know, technology is going to be great in, in the financial world. Um, talk a little bit about Carta X, because I think what excites me so much about it is you fast forward the entire start, startup ecosystem that is quite literally exploding before our eyes and COVID is only, you know, further that even faster. Everybody has all of this paper equity. And that is, by the way, it's really exciting, but it's also for young people and individuals. It's so liquid, right? And it's a really unique thing to manage your wallet with all of this liquid uh, paper money. And Carta X is starting to create this new wave of innovation there. Talk everybody a little bit through not only how did you land on deciding to do it and what's your vision for that part of the business? Yeah, so I, I have always thought about this, this idea of, you know, why is it all paper? Why do we just wait for an IPO and then suddenly it's all liquid? Like, why isn't there a spectrum? Why isn't there a glide path into this, into this stuff? I also think there's a lot that's broken uh, about public markets that, that we can fix. You know, for example, one of the things that's really, I think why a lot of innovation happens in the private world is that we can match investors' uh, investment duration with, with the needs of the business. So, you know, when people invest in Carta, I say, look, we're, we're here for, you know, it's going to be 10 years. Uh, you got, we're going to hold your money before we can return it. And they're like, great, no problem. But if you're in the public markets, you have a shareholder base. Some people are willing to hold 10 years and some are willing to hold 10 minutes. And managing that investor base is extremely difficult and complex. And so if I can control the cap table, but still offer liquidity, that's super powerful for me as a private company CEO. I often say that the, the, you know, the greatest trick Kaiser Sose or the devil ever played on entrepreneurs is to convince them their stock is a commodity and that they shouldn't care who owns it and that uh, Wall Street should be allowed to make a market in, in the value that value creation that they're, they're, they're making. And so if we can offer a product to, to companies and CEOs, it says, look, you can stay liquid, but control your cap table, uh, be liquid and control your cap table. That would be a very compelling uh, alternative to going, to going public. So Mark Andreessen talked about this sort of third option. You know, there's infinite liquidity in public, zero liquidity in um, private, but now there's this third option with Carta X that, that uh, is private and liquid. And if you can, or if we, you know, can solve this problem I think uh, two, two things become really uh, valuable. So one is we solve this balance problem, this equilibrium problem where there's more capital that's flowing into the private markets than there are balance sheets to accept it. Like there just aren't enough good companies that can okay. take it. And that's why, you know, valuations are skyrocketing. But if we can create turnover, we can allow more of that capital to come in, recirculate, fund more uh, companies moving forward and so on, like liquidity begets liquidity. And so we can actually start using this capital more efficiently, which drives down the cost of capital for entrepreneurs. So I think that'll be great for seed, seed early stage companies. Ca capital will become less expensive. It's super expensive today. And the second is once you have an ability, a liquidity mechanism, um, you can now uh, introduce debt, right? Silicon Valley is such a strange anomaly Almost the entire world runs on debt, uh, on debt uh, uh, facilities. Silicon Valley only operates on equity, uh, on equity capital. We have no idea uh, how, to, how to work with debt. And part of the reason is because there's no liquidity, you can't do debt instruments because you don't know the duration of the loan. Totally. And so now if there's a liquidity mechanism to these private companies, 
you can create debt instruments against that, that, that liquidity duration, which means that employees can now actually start getting home loans against their, their stock. And so one of the big things we're rolling out this year for Carta X is employees, um, on, uh, com- employees of companies that are listed on Carta X in private and liquid will be able to get loans collateralized against their, their private stock. Uh, and you can start introducing all of this, cor- this debt, both personal and corporate, into, into the ecosystem that doesn't exist today. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. Um, Henry, can you walk p- somebody through, so let's take you know, a hypo- hypothetical company on Carta X. What is it like for an employee? Like, or, or what is it like for somebody who's transacting in this new, you know, semi-liquid but private market? Yeah. So, um, if it, if your if your employer or former employer lists, um, you'll get a notice on your car in your car account that says, "Hey, there's going to be this uh, liquidity event." We do what's called an auction system, uh, where buyers and sellers. There's no sort of open bid ask where at any point somebody can buy or sell. It's, it's not like that. We do what's called time-based liquidity aggregation. So we pick a point in time. We do a reverse double auction where all the buyers put in limit orders, you know, uh, price and quantity. Sellers put in price and quantity according to their portfolio, uh, how much they have, what they want to sell. And then we'll find a clearing price that clears the most volume. And so everybody gets price improvement. So if you're a seller and you're willing to sell 100 shares at $12, but uh, buyers are willing to buy 100 shares at 15, you will get the $15 price. Wow. Um, so everybody gets price improvement because we drive everything to a single price. Um, and what's really exciting about this is um, uh, employees can be very sophisticated in their sell orders. So they might be able to sell, say, look, I just want to sell 100 shares at 15 bucks. Or they might want to say, look, I want to sell a million dollars at anything over you know, a market cap of two, 2 billion. But if it gets to 3 billion, I want to sell 2 billion. And, and we can do very sophisticated pricing um, uh, preference uh, structures uh, for employees so they can figure out their liquidity needs over time. And the best thing about it is that today's tender offer framework is very episodic. So if an employee is you know, working for a company that's doing a tender, yep. uh, they'll, this is their one shot at getting liquidity. And so they, they sell whatever they, they can get out of, out of it. But if the company, if the employee knows, hey, every quarter or every six months, you know, uh, my, my, my employer is on Carta X allowing shares to list. I know that I only have to sell a little bit now because I'm going to buy a house in nine months, but I'll sell a little now and I'll sell more in six months to buy the house. And so, so employees can really start doing financial planning for themselves, which they can't do today. Which to your point, they really cannot do today. It's incredibly illiquid. Often you have to buy the shares too as you leave um, and you're kind of stuck. And I think what you're basically doing is really helping the everyday employee in a pretty dramatic way that um, I hope the market you know, fully can, can appreciate. Um, Henry, if I step back and think about you, your job as CEO through this, you're literally inventing market dynamics that do not exist, right? I mean, first of all, how fun is that for you? And we're going to come back to you in a moment. But what has this been like for you over the last two years as you recognize you are creating the New York Stock Exchange um, for the, the startup environment? Um, and you get to think about all of the evolution and the rules and the goodness that you get to unlock. Um, but it's also, you know, you're, you're writing the code here. Um, what, is that like, what has that been like for you and your team as you approach strategy? It, it's so exciting. I, I feel like I'm so lucky. I, I got the best job in the world. Um, I, I think one of the, the wonderful things about being an entrepreneur, working on something that, that something like we get to work on at Carta is that um, you do get to bend the arc of human history a little bit. And, and, you know, that, that means you get to write part of the narrative uh, and, and that narrative may be a lost chapter. It, it's possible that none of this works and, you know, I, <laughs> these are all bad ideas and, you know, we we're just a blip, you know, uh, but but if it does work, um, we, we write the narrative for how private markets work, how equity ownership is distributed, right? There, you can imagine a world 50 years from now where um, it's weird. People will talk about the dark ages where, hey, did you, you remember like when you used to go work at you know, Costco or any company and they all you got was cash? Like they didn't give you any ownership of the company that you work for? You know, can, can you remember the dark ages when you work for a tech company and you couldn't get liquidity? Like they gave you options, but you couldn't use that. Like that, that's, that's madness, right? It, it, it's, it looks, it'll look the way we look back at feudalism and go, boy, that, those people were backwards. And, and that we could be a change agent in, in bending that arc of history uh, to accelerate um, that new era. 
and it's so exciting because it's so creative. We get to we get to write the history books uh, ourselves. Um, uh, of course, history books, you know, the ones that stick around go to the winners. So we also have to win. It's not enough to write it. Um, um, but yeah, it's so it's so magical. Um, one fact that I think was new to me as I was just getting really up to speed on Carta over the last year, um, a wild percent of people's equity that they own just goes back to the company. I don't remember what number it is. You will, you will, can you tell everybody what percent of people's stock that the company gives them, they end up leaving and they don't, it all goes back to the company. Is it a third percent? It was, it was a high percentage. Yeah, it's a little over a third. It's in that ballpark and it's, it's really tough and it's, um, it's really unfair. And where it mostly happens is when employees leave and they can't afford to exercise their options. Um, you know, some companies uh, have been more progressive and have extended what's called PTEP post termination exercise period to give employees more time to, to exercise their options. But, but uh, the vast majority of companies still do not do that. Uh, they view it as a dilution saving mechanism uh, that if employees can't exercise, they get it, get it back. It's extremely unfair. And I think one of the things we're also working on when I talk about debt, um, being able to bring debt into Silicon Valley is uh, we're, uh, uh, we have a program where at Carta, uh, we're rolling this out this year actually for employees that can uh, take a loan out to exercise their options. And we're trying to, we're pilot testing that with our own employees as we do everything we pilot internally first. And then um, if we can get it to work, we'll start rolling it out to more pilot companies and then hopefully, you know, make it at scale. Because what's also happening now is a lot of the, um, the venture funds that do loans to employees against stock, they only serve the very high end because they're not going to write a $50,000 loan. They need a million dollar loan uh, to make it worthwhile. And it's super predatory because they're, they're doing this loan at a time when the employee is a, is a forced seller. It's a distressed yep. uh, purchase. Uh, and so, so we really want to get ahead of that. I, it's one of the dark areas of, of Silicon Valley that I hate. Um, and so we're trying to figure that one out. So, so stay tuned. I, I, I think we're getting close. It's amazing. You're absolutely right. In, in 10, 15 years, we're going to be like, can you remember that time that everyday hardworking people were paid in stock that then a third of them literally left the company and didn't get to keep it? Um, or that the markets were so inefficient that, you know, they had to do something wild to be able to keep a small percentage of it. Um, one of the things um, I, I know we talked about in the past, but in so many ways, private equity, startup equity is the new land, right? If we think about people in the past who made tons of money, it was because they went and bought lots of land. Um, but in so many ways, you know, the, the place of extreme value creation in the private market has been in, you know, your, your best startups in the ecosystem like Carta. Um, so you helping people get to keep that is is incredibly special. Um, one of the things I want to shift to, you're building a really authentic company, right? And um, you know you're following some of your own playbook. I'm sure you're learning some from others. But talk a little bit about you know you eat your own dog food. You literally just said we pilot everything we do with our employees. Talk a little bit about the lessons that you've learned in terms of how to make sure that you're staying really true to your mission, but also bringing your team along as you've been on this pretty wild journey. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I often tell when I talk to other founders, I, I say, you know, what makes our job hard um, and fun is that um, we're never good at it. Uh, because by the time you actually get good at something, you, you teach somebody else to do it and then you outsource that work and you go do the next thing. And uh, I, I think, you know, even now, you know, we're a thousand, almost a thousand employees, you know, we've raised $600 million and, you know, it, it says, you know, I still have no idea what I'm doing, just like I didn't have any idea what I was doing as a seed founder. Like I'm, I'm, I'm figuring it out uh, as I go. And I, I think one of the pretty things. Pretty good job. You're pretty, <laughs> pretty good job learning on the job here. Well, well thank you. I, you know, I, I tell up my exec team, you know, let's fake it till we make it uh, kind of thing. And I, I, I think um, one of the things that's really special about, I think Carta, our exec team and our, and our, our employees in general is that, we have this humility that, that, you know, we don't really know how to do this. There's no book on how to build Carta. You know, there's lots of books on how to build things, but there's no book on, on our company. How do you build Carta? And that figuring it out along the way uh, is, is both the joy and, and the journey. Um, and so, so that attitude of, you know, we're students of ourselves uh, and, our, and our mission and company building. Um, I think, you know, we talk a lot about things like the atomic unit of Carta is the problem. 
So, so we organize teams around a problem. We don't have job descriptions. We have problem descriptions, right? What's the problem that we want to solve? Can we go figure out how to solve this problem? You know, you look at um, uh, what our recruiting practices. We, we uh, are very deliberate when we talk about interviews. We go, hey, is this a playbook candidate? Like, does this candidate come with a playbook and this is how they do things? Or is this candidate sort of athletic that figures things out, uh, you know, in real time? And we've, we've tried both and we have had very low success with playbook candidates, which is how most of the industry operates, right? If you hire a VP of, you know, finance, right? They bring a playbook. They're like, hey, here's the spreadsheet I use. Here's how I calculate margin, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that is organizationally, we've just sort of expelled that type of, of persona. And we bring in people that are like, here, I'm ready to learn. Let's, let's figure this out together. Uh, and I think that's been true of all of us. And most importantly, uh, true of me, because if I'm not that way, nobody else will be that way. And it's tough because you have this balancing act as a founder CEO, which is you, you, are, you are the lap. You know, Obama once said uh, one of my favorite lines, he said, um, you know, by the time a problem gets to my desk, you know, uh, it's really hard because there's been 50 people that have tried to solve this as it moves up the chain, you know, and, and so it's hard. You, you are sort of the answer of last resort. So you, you do have to have answers, but you're still learning along the way. Yeah. By the way, guys, I can absolutely vouch uh, for Henry on that. Um, his chief of staff, this amazing woman named Jane, um, you know, just got a really big role inside the business. And uh, you've literally been really focused on taking exceptional talent and making them athletes and giving them big opportunities. And so I've, I've actually gotten the pleasure of watching that happen live. Um, you know, you just said something that is so true. And I know everybody out there listening, you guys are early founders building your business. Um, I know in my own experience of, of building a business, um, everything Henry just said, which is if you know what it takes to build a business, you'd probably not build one. <laughs> um, and it's the, you know, the, the headline of, of this talk today was that, you know, the CEO job is the only job that the better you get at it, the harder it gets. Um, because the better you get at it, the bigger the business is, the more complex it is. And actually your learning curve continues to get steeper. What advice do you have for people? What have you learned about just staying that mental athlete? Because, um, to your point, by the time stuff hits your desk, it's a terribly hard problem. Everybody has tried to solve it and it comes to you. And then that becomes your day every hour, every, you know what I mean? That becomes your job is solving really hard problems. What are your hacks? What are the things that you would want everybody out there to know that you've learned on how do you keep staying mentally fit for your job? You know, I, I'm, I'm maybe in a little bit of a morbid obsession, you know, obsessed with <laughs> oh, why, do, why, do, why do companies fail? It's like, I know whenever I talk to an investor, I ask them, hey, you know, what happens when, when companies do this and then that, right? We're, we're doing this, but how do I make sure we don't do this and that? Like, how, how do I make sure this keeps going like this? Uh, and then my second question is, why do CEOs get fired? Uh, founder CEOs get fired. And I, I, it's really interesting. It's such an anomaly because um, I, I went through this moral challenge, which was, you know, uh, let's imagine I have a phenomenal CFO, but let's let's imagine for a second, like I, you know, my CFO is struggling. You know, if I said that to anybody and the exec team, the board, anything like my CFO is struggling, the immediate answer is, well, let's get a new CFO. You know, um, but if I'm struggling as the founder CEO the, and I say I'm struggling, the immediate answer is how do we find some executives to help Henry where he's struggling? And I said, it's so unfair. Like, how come when the CFO struggles, you, you get rid of him or her, but when the founder struggles, you try to, you try to supplement, uh, yeah. you try to augment. And for it, I couldn't answer that question. I asked everybody this question, like, why is the world that way? I, I, so one person said to me, I think it's just founder religion. You just do it that way. I, I don't know. And what I realized over time was, um, uh, uh, I, I realized why the, the CFO that's struggling, you know, let's say they did a great job from, you know, a hundred million market cap to 500 million market cap, but now it's, you know, it's just different. So, so you have to find, you can find someone, there are people out there that can do, you know, that have done five, scaled CFOs from 500 million to a billion or 2 billion, right? And you, just, you can find that skill set exists. It may be very expensive and hard to find, but that skill set exists in the world. Um, if the founder CEO is the vision founder, that's not really replaceable, right? It, 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 you can't go outsource, you know, and headhunt a vision founder CEO. This just don't, don't exist. That, that is the person that started this company for a reason. And so you want to do almost everything outside of the vision. You can find somebody to do 
do that for. And so what I realized is for me to keep my job, I really have to do two things. I have to keep the vision and articulate it well, because that's the one non-commodity skill that we can't go to market to find. That would be hard to find. Um, and then two, I have to find the people that are gonna make up for my deficiencies. Uh, and if I can keep doing those two things over time, uh, it will work out. I, I will work out and the company will work out. And if I fail at either of those things, it won't. And so that's, that's, that's where I, I focus. I, I mean, I, I love that. And you're absolutely right. Um, you can't replace somebody's vision. You can't. Um, and it's the lightning rod of the founder um, who understands and can feel the business and knows where to continue to take it and how fast you can take it in certain places. And it really is a car that only you hopefully know how to drive. And um, But you need lots of other people around you to, to do a good job. If you think about maybe the one or two hacks for you just personally, things that you swear by, whether it's sleep, exercise, executive, what are the things that you've just figured out that for every founder out there, um, everyone's going to have their own, but what are the one or two that you just swear by that keep you sane? Because there are times where the job is actually insane and it's really hard on us. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, I, I think the two um, pro productivity hacks, I think, you know, is one is, um, this sounds a little bit of a cliche, but it just becomes more true. Um, uh, the only thing that you can't um, fix with money is your time. You know, almost any problem we can fix with money. You know, we have $300 million on the balance sheet. Any problem in the world we can fix with money, except CEO focus. And so being maniacal about how you spend time, and that doesn't necessarily make work harder. I, I, I actually think I'm, unfortunately, I'm one of the laziest CEOs in Silicon Valley. Like, I, I really, like the team's surprised, you know, I work six hours a day sometimes. <laughs> and so, uh, but um, I'm maniacal about how I allocate it. So out of, you know, 40 hours in a week of work, um, you know, you know, I say like the most important thing is work on product. So I'm going to allocate seven hours a week on, to do product, five hours a week to work on revenue, you know, three hours a week to work on employee, like it, whatever it is. And that allocation, if, if you think of your, if, if investors are, are allocators of capital, CEOs have to be allocators of time. How do I, how do I allocate my time correctly? And I think that's the most important thing uh, for, for CEOs to be um, uh, thoughtful about. I, yeah. Uh, were you going to say something else? I, oh, I, sorry. No, go, go ahead. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think um, the other thing I, I found, you know, we're all kind of, we just like live by our calendar some days and there'll be days where I wake up and there's something so much more urgent and you can blow up your calendar. You can say these five meetings don't make sense anymore and you can reschedule. And I think sometimes it's just, well, it's already on there. We're going to keep it in place. Um, but being ruthless about time, um, I, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I want to just step back. You have such a unique position, a perch right now, as you look at everything ahead of Carta in a time where, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly what we've just gone through with COVID, but given you know monetary policy and where we sit, more capital has ever existed in the startup ecosystem. And you sit at Carta driving the bus directly at digitizing that private market in a way that makes it truly efficient. Can you give us just one or two of your predictions? If like tomorrow you had to make a big bet, you had to say this is 100% gonna happen. Just what's clear to you that maybe isn't clear to the rest of us who don't live in your seat? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Alexa. I, I think one maybe, you know, uh, and just keep in mind, uh, my, I'm a 50-50 bet on predictions, but so, uh, <laughs> but what, one prediction is I think um, there will be some structural changes that we've seen that will continue and, non and, and changes that are non-structural that will go away. And I'll give one of each. I think there will be a flood of, uh, I think the, the flood into alternative assets will continue. And so whether it's venture, whether it's private equity, crypto, like all these things, the, the, um, the, that will continue, not, not even because of monetary policy, but because the traditional place that investors could capture alpha was in public markets. Most of that alpha has been competed away. It, it's just very hard to capture alpha in, in public markets. And so that's why capital is moving into private where you, you can still capture alpha. And it will take decades before that alpha is competed away. Uh, in many of those in private markets. And so you will continue to see capital flow looking for looking for alpha in private markets. So I, I think that structurally will continue. Um, I think the way that it's happening, I think it's still early days. I think a lot of the things that we're looking at 
for example, and I'll, I'll pick on SPACs a little bit. You know, I, I think the issue with SPACs is um, I don't, I think SPACs is the inverse. It's like this phenomenon that's happening that, that won't continue structurally. You know, today we have more SPACs than we, than we have companies that are eligible. And, um, and it, the way that these things are structured and the promotes on them and so on, it's, it's the retail investor that's being taken advantage of. And that's usually how this stuff works, um, is the retail invest investors are taken advantage of first and, and then things fall out. And, and I think the reason it, it won't work is that there's no long-term incentive plan in these SPACs for these companies. And so if a company, you know, the, the, the IPO or even direct listing process is meant as a gatekeeper to make sure the companies that do go public are prepared and ready and able to be public companies. Now the SPACs have found a, a back door into the public company. So if a company that was not ready and able to go public is now able to go public via a back door, is that good or bad for the company? Nothing else has changed. All that's happened is they found a back door into, into a market that they probably shouldn't be in yet. And so I think you're going to see if when the market turns, I think you're going to see a, lo a lot of pressure on these companies that, that got, went public either prematurely or shouldn't be public in the first place. So th those might be my two, two predictions. More continued investment in alternative assets, and hopefully we can be a nexus and, and a provider of that. Um, but then I think some, some of the things like SPACs and some of the, the uh, aggressive crypto stuff, I think and when a market turns, it will, it will clean things out. Um, first of all, I couldn't agree more with everything that you just said. Um, and you're right, uh, when incentives aren't perfectly aligned, um, unfortunately, the everyday retail investor could, could get badly hurt. Um, so I, I agree. Um, I want to just quickly use our last few minutes here. Um, you're a CEO through COVID. Like little pictures, little zooms, all trying to still row in the same direction. Um, give us one or two things that you've learned about just being a great CEO through COVID. One of the things I, I know about you is you do stand-ups twice a week, um, which is you know pretty special. I, I think that's a you know I would say probably one percent of CEOs actually do you know that level of communication. But what are the things that you've learned that everybody should know through COVID? How you run an efficient business and, and keep you know the train on the tracks? Yeah. I think the first thing I learned is I, I miss seeing my employees so much. Uh, like it, it sucks. Um, I'm not sure they miss seeing me as much because uh, they all love working from home, but I, I hate it. Uh, and um, I miss them. Uh, I think, you know, we were one of the first offices to close, um, you know, when companies started closing in, in March, February, March. Um, and, you know, I, I thought it was like for a month, you know, protect our employees. And I didn't know, I don't think anybody quite saw how long this would, would take, uh, at least in February last year. Um, it's, we were, we have nine offices. Everybody works, most people work in an office, um, but we've been very tele, you know, video. We were early, early. We were one, I think we were Zoom's largest customer when they were a Series A company. We were very early adopters. Um, so we, we moved online really well. It's been super impressive to see the efficiency of the business. Like it's, we've executed extremely well. People have really taken to it. I, I think the, the biggest thing about it is I, I do think, I don't think there's a toll on the company as much. I think there's a toll on people, you know, yes. when they're stuck at home and they don't have social contact and families, it's just a really tough time. And in fact, one of the things we did at Carta is we moved from a, a, a PTO policy to what we call a, a MTO policy, which is a minimum time off. Because one of the things we notice is that people are working harder um, and taking less time off. And so employees now ha are required to take a minimum 20 days vacation. I think 18, maybe something like that, but we have a minimum number of time that was required for people to take off because we were facing, seeing a lot of burnout. Uh, and that, that, that's been a real concern of ours. Um, and, you know, when we go back home, I'm trying to, um, we're split. We have a lot of employees that can't wait to get back to work in the office. Other employees that don't, I don't know how this is going to shake out. I'm trying to make the case to my employees that we should all get back in the office and see each other and all of those things. Um, we'll, we'll find out um, as, as, as the Moscow and the, the vaccine gets released. Um, I absolutely love that. And I'd never heard that MTO minimum time off. And I, again, couldn't agree more with that point. Henry, I want to end on one fun question, which is um, through now the almost decade of building and running this amazing business, what has been the biggest pinch me moment where you actually like got to talk to your family and say, holy smokes, I can't believe this happened. What was that for you? An, an early employee got liquidity and sent me a picture of a, a you know, young, young family of a house they bought in Austin, Texas that they dreamed of from the, from the liquidity from their, their stock as an early employee. That was, 
that was the moment I got, I, yeah, uh, that was a magic moment. That is incredibly cool. Um, Henry, I'm one of your biggest fans. I love every time I get to hang out with you and spend time. Uh, everybody, hopefully you learned a lot from Henry. Um, I really do think he's one of the formative kind of uh, leading CEOs out there doing great stuff for our ecosystem. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today, Henry. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alexa. Alexa, thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.